good evening, everyone. My name is Richard Geddy, the uh, Director of Outreach Programs for STM, and I am your uh, chair for this session, uh, mainly because I was, I've also been the chair of the judges of the uh, Alps Awards for Innovation in Publishing this year. Uh, what we're about to experience is some um, uh, a quick showcasing of all nine of this year's finalists. Um, to become a finalist uh, in, in this uh, award, you have to be pretty damn good. Um, there are nearly 40 uh, applications. Uh, as chair of the judges, I coordinated the whittling down of those 40 or so to the illustrious team of uh, nine uh, panelists that you have here, or shortly to have here, in, in front of you. Um, a panel of judges has spent a couple of days um, working on this. We have amongst our judges, publishers, librarians, and somebody from the standards uh, industry. Uh, the rules for this session are uh, that um, each uh, finalist uh, comes up uh, in alphabetical order of the name of their organization uh, uh, and will talk about their their, um, their their product for no more than four minutes. I shall be indicating uh, to them with a series of flashing lights going from green, orange, and red on the desk here. Um, four minutes is about the same time it takes to boil an egg, and I like my eggs runny, so please don't um, go over, overstep your four minutes. Um, we want to be out here in time for uh, a session at the bar afterwards. So uh, I, I'm going to, uh, first of all, call on book metrics, and I believe we have Martin Rolands and Milan Wielinga. Uh, please welcome, make your way to the podium here. Hey, Martijn, you look desperate. What's the matter? I'm looking for a good book in neuroscience, but uh, since uh, Springer changed the covers to uh, standard covers, they all look the same. Mm. So I have no idea which one is actually relevant for me. Ah, uh, but I see. But, you know, we built for an app for that. Um, give me one minute. I get it, but books don't count for my funder or for my university in the research evaluation. So um, that's true, but you know what? That's because there's a huge focus in ISI and Web of Science um, on journals. And um, we can now for the first time demonstrate that actually books matter. And that's great news for social sciences and humanities. 
because books actually have an incredible collection value. And did you know that each book in the Springer database has over 20 citations, each single book? And actually, did you know that 10 citations actually are pre-1995? So books matter for a long period. So there's also this book out of 1991. You can see that. This book has 70 mentions. And imagine, 70 mentions. Well, social media are here only for five to six years. So. So I get it, OK. So if I use book metrics, I can stop judging books by the cover. Yeah, indeed. So one last thing. So book metrics is a Springer product, although we have the ambition that to, to roll it out and actually also uh, the next version should be available for other publishers. Um, it's built on technology provided by Altmetric. And if you want to hear more about Bookmetrics and uh, Altmetric, there's a session tomorrow, 1C at 10.30. That's all there is. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you to the two of you. And thank you to Leroy Anderson for such lovely music as well. Um, we now move on to Chorus, and uh, here is David Crotty to talk about that. Um, um, my presentation is going to be a lot less musical and dramatic, however, I'll try to get through it. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, um, we're in an increasingly complex situation. Uh, researchers, institutions, librarians, um, publishers alike are all uh, seeing a lot of uh, re increasing regulation and policies around access to research results. Um, a recent study showed that there are at least 663 funding agency and institutional policies around public access to research papers. Each one is a little different. Um, because research is increasingly collaborative, most papers list multiple sources of funding, multiple institutions, and often multiple countries of origin. So the number of possible permutations um, from combinations of 663 variables is close enough to infinity that most calculators can't figure it out for you. That creates a really big challenge for a publisher who wants to take care of authors, make sure everyone's in compliance with their requirements. Infinity is a really big number to track. Um, problem extends beyond publishers. Institutional administrators and librarians are increasingly tasked uh, with making sure all researchers remain in compliance. A recent survey of academic libraries found that an average of slightly over four library employees devoted at least 10% of their time on open access initiatives. Uh, funding agencies want to know about their return on investment, and researchers certainly don't want to lose their funding over a technicality, yet in a recent poll, uh, more than half of researchers did not know their funding act, uh, funding agency's access policy. Um, we're seeing increasingly enormous uh, administrative and uh, financial burden from these policies. There's got to be a better way. And as publishers, we've been building the infrastructure to drive a real solution for years now. Chorus was born out of this challenge. Can we build a system that automates the public access process, that meets policy goals, and saves everyone a huge amount of time, effort, and money? Uh, CORUS stands for the Clearinghouse for the Open Research of the United States, but the group behind CORUS, the not-for-profit, is called CORE uh, because the system is meant to be scalable and expand well beyond our initial focus on U.S. federal funding agencies. Um, CORUS is uh, incredibly cost-effective because it's built on top of infrastructure that already exists. Uh, for a publisher like OUP, it costs us less than 50 pounds per journal per year to run CORUS. Uh, because of this, we can offer it for free to, um, to funding agencies so tax dollars can go more towards funding research rather than administrative oversight. Um, how it works is simple. When an author submits a paper, they have to identify their funding source through FundRef, which now lists over 10,000 funders. Paper then goes through the usual peer review and, and publication process, and it is officially identified for uh, uh, tracking purposes and making it publicly accessible. Um, the funder information that comes from the author creates a tag in the paper's metadata, and that sets, every, sets everything in motion. Chorus points users directly to the best available version of the articles in context on the publisher's website, either immediately or after the publisher's embargo. Um, Chorus works just as well with gold open access as with green access policies. Uh, the reader gets a better experience because they get to see the paper in context. They get all the uh, 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 nice functions that we put into our websites. They get to see uh, associated articles, editorials. They get to see corrections and retractions, which usually don't make it into repositories. Publisher gets to keep that traffic that you lose when a someone goes off to read a copy somewhere else. 
uh, takes away from your counter stats, your alt metrics, your ability to sell ads. Uh, a copy is deposited in a dark archive if the journal goes out of business or for some reason doesn't make it freely available. This, uh, it comes to light, so we're guaranteeing access. Um, for compliance, we have a set of dashboards freely available for funders, publishers, institutions. They can all monitor compliance centrally rather than having to track down each individual paper one by one. We have an open API to drive discovery services. We're working with text and data mining services as well. Um, we have signed on, uh, we have working agreements now signed with three U.S. federal funding agencies, and you can expect to hear several more announcements in the coming weeks. Um, we're talking to international NGOs and uh, funding agencies as well. We have 36 publisher members now signed on. And if you're not a member, come talk to me or go to our website. Thanks. Uh, thank you, David. And here's uh, Eli Flens, which I believe will be Ian Mulvaney. Ah, uh, uh, Ian Mulvaney and some water, a good mix. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, uh, I'm going to tell you um, why we built Lens, uh, how you can use Lens, who's using Lens, and what we think the ROI of Lens is. Uh, why we built it, eLife, we want to enable scientists to accelerate discovery, and Lens is a product that takes away the pain of reading papers online. When you read a paper today, either the PDF on the right or the HTML version on the left, it's a single column it's very difficult to read the paper and in context see the attributes of the paper like the figures, tables, data, and so forth. Lens gives you a nice two-pane view so you can read the paper on the left and view the images on the right. And we provide a nice interlinking between the two so you can keep the reading in context with the image as you go. Uh, the way we do this is in browser, we take the XML, the publisher XML, JATS, we convert it to JSON and we convert that to HTML on the fly in the web browser. Um, it was an ad hoc product. Uh, Ivan Grupsic came to us as a PhD student with the idea. We really liked it. Uh, we developed it with Michael Auflita and the Substance developers and Graham Knott. And um, the development time scale was uh, within 14 weeks we got to launch with the product. In the first year and a half, we spent about 75,000 pounds on the development of the product, which if you do digital product development, I can tell you that's cheap. Um, okay, how can you guys use it? Uh, it is an open source project. It is BSD licensed. So all you need to do is build a splash page, call our JavaScript, and point that page at your publisher XML, and it's going to work for you. Who's using it? We have a number of publishers in collaboration with Highwire who've deployed it. Uh, you can use Lens to view this nice two-column view of any paper whose XML is listed in PubMed Central or PubMed using the OA Sandbox interface. Um, the American Mathematical Society have extended Lens to add a mathematical uh, format and element. It's extensible. Uh, the architecture of the tool is really nice and easy to extend. Uh, it's been integrated into open journal systems. Uh, here's an example of a book that's been set with uh, Lens. That question came up in the Q&A with the panel. Can it do books? I said no. I was wrong. Um, we're using it in eLife. Here are a number of... Uh, tabs that get you into Lens that we've experimented with. We've gone from click-throughs of about 0.5% up to 4% recently. Uh, we think there's real potential for this kind of tool in the production process. And with our content processing vendor, uh, Extra Premedia, we now have it in the production process as a tool and a visualization for how to interact with author queries with the author during that process. The underlying framework can be used to create editors so this is an example of an editor built on top of the Substance stack. Uh, we're catching up with you, John. Not quite there yet, but in a little while. Um, ROI for us, it's very early days for this product, but we mainly see this as a compelling test bed for HTML5-driven technologies in this sector, and we would encourage you to have a look and see if you can use it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. I'm now calling upon John Sack, who's going to be talking about Impact Visor from Highwire. Whoa, here we go. So before Highwire uh, developed Impact Visor, publishers and editors said to us, help us understand what's happening with citation impact. What we built as a result was an integrated database 
combining citation data from multiple sources with published and unpublished metadata, as well as usage and other data. And then on top of that, we built easy to use interactive visualizations, and I'll show you some of the visualizations. What we built lets you investigate three things. What happened with the articles you rejected? What's the impact of articles you accept? And what's changing in your field? First, we'll look at what we, how we investigate and interpret what happened with articles you rejected. The rejected article tracker, also called the RAT, is the first of the Impact Visor viewers. It answers important editorial and publishing questions. Where do my rejected articles get published? Do I reject good articles? How much do they get cited? Am I seeding my competition with these good articles? Do I have enough good articles to start a new journal or a new section? The visualization shown here shows to what, ex uh, what journals rejected articles are going. Each journal has its own box. The bigger the box, the more articles went to that journal. The visualization also shows how much articles get cited by the deeper red color uh, of the box showing more citations. So you use the RAT to get evidence for starting a new journal, including the Cascade Journal, or starting a new section of a journal, and for changing your editorial policies, practices, scope. With this next viewer, we switch from looking at rejected articles to the ones you published. With the hot article tracker, called the HAT, you examine published articles to determine which are most cited and to visualize impact trends and demographics. For example, show me the articles I published last year that are most cited this year, or which highly cited articles are about to age out of my impact factor calculation, or if these are my hot articles, what are my cold ones? So you use the hot article tracker to see patterns among highly cited articles. Surprises such as new trending topics that may uh, have encourage you to see a shift that's coming in your discipline. Our next viewer is visually similar to the hat, but now with the hot object tracker, so that's the hot, we are looking at groups of articles, not individual articles, to understand impact performance of types of articles grouped together, where the type is something that's meaningful to you. This helps you see patterns in the forest of all those article trees. For example, you can compare impact across table of contents sections to learn which sections have the most citations or get cited fastest. You could compare your clinical trials articles with your reviews articles to see which have more impact. Or you could compare special issues with each other. The section performance analyzer is the next viewer. It compares the impact performance of groups of articles, such as a journal section, a metadata based slice, or even a whole journal over time. With this viewer, you can compare a group in one year to an equivalent group in another year and see how they're performing. Are they cited more? Are they cited less? For example, are my clinical trials published this year getting more citations than the clinical trials I published last year? And in development now is a viewer that integrates multiple dimensions of impact, multiple types of impact, starting by putting together citations with usage and then with social mentions. With this viewer, we visualize the relationships between citations and other types of impact, such as article downloads and social mentions. The advantage of seeing all these together is that usage and social mentions show impact even earlier than citations. Our clients have found that it works. With Impact Visor, they can validate and tune their instincts, they can investigate changes, and they can make evidence-based decisions. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, we now turn to Catherine Halley from JSTOR Daily. Good evening. I think it's evening. I have terrible jet lag, but I guess this is next. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, JSTOR Daily, where news meets its scholarly match. Meet Smart News. Um, JSTOR Daily is an online magazine published by JSTOR, which is a digital library of more than 2,000 peer-reviewed journals, books, and other materials. Um, do, do people know what JSTOR is? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, JSTOR Daily publishes uh, high-quality, carefully researched editorial stories that, that provide an alternative to the listicles and clickbait that are so popular and dominate mainstream media. Our stories explore ideas, 
analyze current events, and highlight scholarship on JSTOR. Our mission, slightly different from what you see up here, is to make the world smarter by providing context for today's news. We offer open access to the scholarship that we reference. And as you see here, the mission is to make archival peer-reviewed scholarship, scholarly research, and other library content relevant and accessible to a general audience by connecting it to the news and offering open access to the original research and other content housed on the, in, on the JSTOR library. Our readers are autodidacts and lifelong learners. I suspect many of them are the people that don't identify as researchers that we were hearing about earlier. And our writers are journalists, librarians, and scholars. Our tagline, where news meets its scholarly match, encapsulates our belief that deeply contextualized news doesn't have to be boring. <laughs> Incidentally, one of the rejected uh, taglines was a shot of news with a scholarship back. I don't know if you have that phrase or that sort of a phrase in um, British English, but in American English, a, a beer back is what you have after you have, you have your, your um, sort of your accompaniment um, to the news. Um, but I think you see my point. Um, we offer breadth and depth. I'm going to click through, uh, what you're gonna see on these slides is, are just screenshots of headlines from the magazine. So I think they're probably more entertaining than a list of words <laughs> describing. We publish um, three to four short blog posts a day um, and one long form feature article a week in a wide range of disciplines ranging from the humanities to social sciences and to the hard sciences. Um, we also offer depth, encouraging a re general reader, regardless of their institutional affiliation, to discover and dive into the library. In fact, uh, we encourage both discovery and rediscovery, essentially bringing archival research back into circulation. The scholarship that's featured on JSTOR Daily is read hundreds of times more than it would be otherwise. Um, have we been successful? Well, so far, so good. <laughs> um, we've had both highbrow success, which let me, let me actually click through these slowly so you can read them. Um, will the real St. Patrick please stand up? <laughs> Mosquitoes. You can see the wide range of things. We have a linguistics column that's done very well. Um, this is tracing the specter of the welfare queen, looks back at some research, social studies research about welfare. Um, and where this, this um, um, sort of uh, this myth came from. Um, this is a linguistics column. This is about a place where Star Wars was filmed. <laughs> um, so here we are. We, we encourage discovery, helping readers discover new journals and expose them to scholarship they knew nothing about, and rediscovery, bringing archival scholarship back into circulation. Um, We've had highbrow success. Um, the New York Times Now app picked us, um, our, our linguistics column up. Uh, the BBC has picked us up, Time Magazine, the Long Los Angeles Times, and Longreads. Um, these are just a few of the places. Um, and we've also had lowbrow success. Um, Reddit and um, Reddit, you'll see one story here about bald eagle conservation brought 300,000 visitors in one day to the site. Um, it continues to get circulated. People have long conversations about the articles that we're publishing and then the, the underlying scholarship as well on uh, Reddit and, and Dig is another place that picks up our content. Um, the content strategist um, recently praised our success on social media, dubbing us the anti-Red Bull for our ability to take scholarly news viral. Um, and they like us on Twitter. <laughs> um, these are just a few, a few of the um, tweets that look like my mother wrote them. Um, <laughs> I signed up for JSTOR Daily yesterday, and no other newsletter has proven its value so quickly. Um, <laughs> JSTOR Daily, you're starting to enthrall me. Um, so what does this mean for JSTOR? 30 seconds, okay, what does this mean for JSTOR? It's this huge repository of knowledge, most of which, or mu much of it, is never accessed. While JSTOR Daily publishes editorial content rather than peer-reviewed scholarship, we hope the magazines will transform, J transform JSTOR from a passive repository of knowledge to an active participant in the generation and dissemination of collective human wisdom. Thank you. Me.
Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. And I call upon Melinda Kennaway uh, to talk about QDOS. Right. Um, QDOS is a web-based service that helps research publications get found, read, and applied. And the idea for QDOS came from the waste that we see happening with so much of what we publish not getting the readership that it deserves. So there's a mountain of content out there that is never going to have a positive impact in the world. And increasingly, the impact of underutilized publications is going to be felt by researchers, publishers, and institutions more directly as new metrics of performance gain momentum. The research world is facing a sea change in how it is evaluated. And at QDOS, we believe that one of the results of this is going to be a growing focus on effective dissemination after publication. But the dissemination choices that researchers have are diverse and confusing and growing by the day, um, from networking and profile sites through to new publishing formats and platforms and many new ways of looking um, at how their work is performing. But there's nowhere that researchers can get any kind of joined up understanding um, of all of these things. So that's why we launched QDOS back in May last year. Um, our aim is to make dissemination really easy with simple tools for researchers to explain their publications in lay, langu in lay language, so a topic that's come up a lot already today. They can also join up related resources to give context to their work and share links to their publications within their networks by email, social media, through their blogs, and so on. We also help remove the guesswork for authors um, by helping them track the impact of outreach activities and learn where to focus their efforts for best effect. Our aim is to work with the system rather than against it, so we want to align the effort of publishers, universities, funders, and researchers to drive impact by providing tools to these organizations to monitor, support, and amplify author outreach efforts. So since we launched um, in just over a year, we have attracted over 60,000 researcher registrations. Um, we have some 5 million views of publication profile um, pages. We've generated over 40,000 referrals to publisher sites. We've been named by Outsell as one of their top 10 to watch. We've been voted best new end user product by readers of the Charleston Advisor. Um, and of course, we're here today as a finalist for the ALP Publishing uh, Award for Innovation. So it's been a, a busy year. Um, authors tell us they find QDOS easy to use and agree that it is effective in helping them work towards their goals. And many publishers are seeing higher downloads when authors use QDOS. For Emerald, for example, um, they've seen a factor of three or four times uh, the usage when, um, when authors are using the QDOS tools. Impact for individual authors can be substantial. And because we support legitimate article sharing, um, we link directly to content on publisher sites. Authors feel confident that they can use our tools without contravening publisher copyright. As you can see, we have over 45 um, publishers that we're working with so far, and the cross-publisher nature of our platform is a big part of our value proposition. Authors want to tell the story of their research in one place. They want to access the metrics relating to all their publications in one place. And of course, most of our publishers value being part of a, an independent group that isn't overly influenced by one publisher or one particular subject area. We've recently launched a pilot program with institutions. We're working with a range of universities all over the world. And we also um, have a, a really exciting society product um, that we're working on. We're um, still really early in our development. We've got ambitious plans driven by our vision to have a profound impact on research effectiveness. We want to drive substantial and lasting change in the way in which our research information is disseminated. Uh, broadening the appeal of academic content, encouraging interdisciplinary discovery, helping authors and publishers benefit from new communication tools as they become available, and bringing metrics to the center of all of this so we can understand what tools and activities are actually most effective. So watch this space. Uh, there's a lot more yet to come from QDOS. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Melinda. And now here's John Hammersley from Overleaf. Hello, everyone. Um, 
Uh, firstly, uh, this is my first time at ALPSP, and it's amazing to be here. And I really loved the tone that was set in the opening keynote about the fact that we're living in really exciting times and that there's you know, lots of rapid change that's going on. Um, it's certainly been a rapid change for us. So three years ago, my co-founder and I were designing control systems for driverless cars and writing research papers with our other research partners and with our lab. Um, and as part of that, John built a piece of software that made it easier for us to collaborate. And because it was on the internet, um, a lot of other people really started using it. And it's been an amazing few years. And the reason why I think people started using it was because you know, the internet has done a huge amount for making it easier to connect with people, discover new research. And there was a piece of uh, research done by the Royal Society which shows that collaboration is increasing. You know, more papers are written by more than one international author. And that those collaborative works actually get more attention and get more citations. But what we found, you know, collaboration was really frustrating. We were emailing files back and forth. And we're mathematicians, so we used to write in LaTeX, but we were working with other people in um, disciplines that were more used to Word. And if you email a LaTeX file to someone who uses Word, then you really don't get anywhere. So, you know, this problem then gets exacerbated by the fact that these files have to be passed around to reviewers, they have to be passed around to publishers and editorial teams, and you just create this big mass of documents. So what Overleaf does is it puts the document in the center and different people access it at different times, and everyone's always got the latest version, and it just simplifies the whole process. Um, it's a really simple web interface. We try to make it as easy as possible to get started. Um, so about over half our users are students, um, and they use it because it's really easy to use. You go to the website, you click create a new paper, and you can write your paper. You don't even have to sign up to try it out, and it's free for authors to use. Um, you can see there that that doesn't look very much like LaTeX. Um, so we've built this nice rich text mode, um, which sits on top of LaTeX, so you can edit in a more word-like environment, if that's what you like. Um, but underneath, um, there's a full support for LaTeX, so if you're a mathematician or you like to use that format, you can do. And you're going to have to upload files associated, you know, images and figures that you need to put into your paper. One of the big requests we had sort of a year or so ago was for track changes and commenting. So there's now a really easy way to insert comments and a really easy way to view changes. Um, this was particularly important for students who wanted to get feedback from a research supervisor um, who had very little time and wanted something that was as easy as possible for them to use. Um, but you know, we get some really great feedback. And actually, so this is a, a little case study that I like to talk about. So Artem um, worked, Artem's based in Montreal. Um, Jacob, one of his collaborators, is based in Oxford in the UK. And David's based in the Moffat Cancer Center in Florida. And they got together, and they wrote a paper on Overleaf in just four days. And then they put it out there in the archive. And that was research that otherwise might well have languished you know, on notes in a, in a file, in a drawer, you know, until they had time to finish it. But they had, a, they had a weekend, long weekend, to do some work together, and they got that paper out there. We also have some big collaborations on Overleaf, so there were 62 authors on a paper that was recently submitted to F1000 Research, and Michael needed a bit of help with some table positioning in LaTeX, and because the document's online, one of our experts could go in and give him some quick help just before he submitted. So we're making it a lot easier for people to you know, get their papers in the right format and in the right state to be submitted. We're not just working with publishers, so we've got a big pilot going with Stanford University who are rolling it out to their staff and students. Um, so this makes the pro version of Overleaf available to all the staff and students, and the libraries get some more data on who's collaborating with who, you know, is physics, the physics department working with biology more, are we working with Harvard more or with MIT more? And so if there's, any institution, if there's any librarians in the audience, please do grab me afterwards, and I can give you more information. Um, we link to a lot of other tools that authors use. Um, you can publish to a lot of different destinations when you've finished. Um, we do customizable templates, specifically for journals, where we put in the information, the author guidelines, into the template. And we can push into systems like Editorial Manager and Scholar One when you've finished. This whole yeah, there's a whole editorial workflow thing there that um, F1000 Research are using so that when a paper comes in, the editorial team gets access to it, and it's a protected version so they can make comments and leave track changes for the author, 
then when, the, when they're ready, they invite the author to view those changes. It can very, very quickly, over a couple of days, clear up some minor formatting issues with the paper and get it ready for publication. And you know, they, they do post-publication peer review, so they want to get these papers out as quickly as possible. And they went from not having any latex submissions to 10 to 15% of submissions every year now come through us. So yeah, over a quarter of a million people are now using it worldwide. And if you're a publisher or an institution, grab me afterwards for a chat. Thank you very much. And now, uh, right find XML for mining. Thank you very much. Bill O'Brien standing in for Matt Peterson, so I've had minutes of preparation for this discussion today, but I'm really excited to tell you about our newest product at Copyright Clearance Center, why it's hugely valuable for publishers, increases the value of your content, and also um, is hugely valuable to your end users and researchers. So, anybody in the audience uh, ever been to Boston? We'll share some uh, some unique anecdotes. So Boston, close to CCC headquarters and referred to by Oliver Wendell Holmes as the hub of the universe, Boston has something in common with the latest publishing technology, text mining. Boston is also home to similarly innovative life sciences companies who are becoming increasingly dependent on text and data mining to gain an edge and a competitive ed, edge in a competitive and an even cutthroat environment. And yes, Boston area is also home to many innovative publishing houses who have recognized that providing practical text and data mining solutions for their content will strengthen the relationships they have with subscribers and researchers. Sell more. And yes, the Boston area is also, oops, According to legend, the old streets of Boston were just cow paths that got paved, which explains the way they wander and wind, not to mention one-way streets, rotaries, dead ends, and potholes. You got to see it after our record winter. The result is a city of frustrated, even furious drivers. Google may be close to perfecting a driverless car, but I doubt we'll ever see one in Boston. Apart from the aggravation, is there a real cost to all the traffic? According to a recent study on urban car commuting, the congestion adds up. Drivers waste an average of 64 hours in traffic every year. There's 1,400 in burned up fuel, and lost productivity is almost immeasurable. Text mining is like that too. Multiple text formats and licenses, lack of standards and access. At the lab bench or desk of a big farmer, this leads to a waste of time and resources. No small problem when you're after the next miracle cure or uh, earth-shattering drug. While Boston traffic can stretch for miles, that's nothing when it comes to text mining challenge. This is a rough estimate of the 24 million articles in Medline at seven pages each and printed and stacked. That would lead to a pile about 10 miles high. The point here is I can't read all of that. You can't read all of that. And so we need computers and machine readable content to help us. So how does it work? Text mining software takes unstructured text in the form of documents and files and breaks it down into smaller chunks and interprets the meaning. The result of this process is that the end user is presented with a set of assertions, facts, or relationships. The result of mining projects inform a wide range of business activity, including drug discovery, drug interactions, clinical tr trial development, drug safety monitoring, and competitive intelligence. Text mining is limited to abstracts because it is what's most accessible and available. Available. There is significantly more info in full text. Many text mining questions can't be answered by looking at abstracts. Obtaining agreements and feeds from publishers is complicated and expensive. There's a high cost for companies to negotiate directly, obtain feeds, and deal with different formats and restrictions. Keeping the content up to date for publishers is a real challenge. There are so many publishers, all with different formats. This makes importing into your text mining tool a chore and is very expensive. Researchers can't mine content they are not subscribed to and are missing out. The benefits, CCC's XML for mining service expands the capability of companies' text mining efforts beyond article abstracts and open access articles, allowing researchers to search and download the text from a single source, eliminating the need to manually find, acquire, license, and convert articles for dispar from disparate publishers and other online sources. It enables researchers to quickly and efficiently create collections of full text articles from multiple publishers in XML format for text mining. XML for mining is specifically designed to allow users 
users to access and obtain machine-readable content. Content into our systems and lingu oh, uh, it makes it easy to import content into our systems. CCC and Linguamatics have a strong relationship and look for more relationships and partners like this. Improve the results of your text mining efforts enables tech text miners to go beyond the abstract level to search downloads and mine full text articles in XML from both company subscriptions as well as unsubscribed publisher content. XML for mining gives you more accurate and richer results, enabling you to make discoveries that can only be found in full text. It also ensures copyright compliance because the content in the service is pre-authorized for commercial text mining. You get the peace of mind knowing that your content mining projects comply with copyright, minimizing your organization's risk of infringement. It saves time and money, aggregates full text article content, and normalizes metadata from multiple publishers into a secure secure cloud for fast and easy access, reducing the time and costs associated with article conversions, content management, and negotiations with publishers. XML for mining accelerates access to articles, uh, article collections for content mining, giving the mining professionals more time to focus on analysis and discovery. ALPSP members got into the publishing business to make a difference in science and learning. XML for mining makes it possible to continue along that path. Thank you very much. And finally, Xvolution. Okay, good evening. Thank you to, uh, uh, to, to be here. Uh, I'm Bishinike Swan, and this is my colleague, Ms. Uh, uh, Sasithorn. She is the manager of publishing and printing of NASA Thailand. We come to present here for the evolution. It's not just a board game, but it's an education tool for the local Thai children. I am the PhD student uh, in Thai who are doing on the eco literacy or biological uh, education. So I always think about how we can initiate our uh, children to understand the science and nature by the local Ui dance. One day they can use it to step up to the global scale. I was in London in 2009, the year of evolution. Uh, uh, 150 years ce celebration of the origin of species book of Darwin. I went to the Darwin house in Kent and it really inspired me because Darwin worked here, uh, proved his uh, theory here more than 30 years. And he changed the local evidence to be the global spotlight of the scientific, scientific world. So it really inspired me when I Come, uh, when I went back to Thailand, I proposed the evolution project to the NASDAQ. And uh, we aim to create the education tools that talk about the natural selection, but uh, based on the ties of uh, side information and evidence. We select the dinosaurs because the children love them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At the second, Thailand is the hotspot of Southeast Asia uh, research on the party ontology. Uh, we have more than t 100 uh, records of uh, dinosaur discovery in our country, but do sh uh, do our children uh, do not uh, know them well, so we have to communicate. We have a heritage in our country. So, uh, uh, I think the local contents will be the easily to connect to the real study site and uh, the teaching information at local museum. So we, uh, we select to uh, create the board game because now it's very popular in Thailand. But 
all of them are import from the international uh, company, and I think it is a first step for initiate the uh, creator in Thailand to in uh, to rest in the education tool from size uh, from the local size. We aim that the evolution not just a board game, but will be a prototype and a platform of education tool and in hand activity for the teacher, parents, museum, and learning center of Thailand. Moreover, we are the co partner that uh, is the toys and the children public Shin company and mobile application company to develop the product together. We have that our process of in-house uh, material contents and production process. We will initiate our students to understand global size theory, but based on the surrounding of them. Okay, okay. In the first time, last six years ago, when I talked with Bishanit about his proposal, I didn't want to publish just a book because I have imagined to some products that developed from his idea. The product was produced and published in January 2015 by the collaboration with two partners, Gisobis Company Limited, Thai Mobile Application Solution Developer, the exciting augmented reality technology and matching mobile application were added as a gimmick for the user and also support of the future social interaction. The other partner is Brand Toys, a toy manufacturer with tech green products for children. This collaboration are also in kind and in cash contribution. Yeah. After more than five years development, the Exploration Board game was launched at a certain department store in the downtown area of Bangkok. We also use our product and prototype in many other ways too, for example, the game was simplified and used as part in Thailand science and technology fairs, an exhibition and subway station, and many scientific activities, not only NASDAQ activities, but also other organizations such as National Geological Museum, National Science Museum, Silinta Dinosaur Museum, and Science Center for Education. From the start, the monetary profit is not the major reason or target for our innovation, but the sign communication to public, including the distribution of scientific information and the application of a new way for public understanding of science are our concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to all the uh, uh, awards finalists. Um, we're very grateful to you for uh, making it here and for keeping us uh, to time. Um, some bad news, I'm afraid, that if you want to find out who wins, you'll have to uh, come for dinner tomorrow night. Um, uh, the awards will, uh, the, the final announcement of the uh, overall winner will take place um, after dinner and before the quiz. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you then, and I'll just conclude by saying very many thanks to Publishing Technology for sponsoring these awards. Uh, see you all tomorrow. <laughs>